If you have your Bibles, I want to ask that you turn me. Join me in Galatians chapter 1 this morning, verses 10 through 12, where we'll be as we continue our journey through Galatians. This morning, we find ourselves in a spot in the text that really talks about people pleasing. And this morning, the sermon title is the pitfalls of people pleasing. Let me ask you a question. How many of you remember or know Sally Fields? How many of you? Let me see your hands this morning. Sally Fields. She's won a, a, a few Oscars. In the early part of her career, she had won an Oscar, and she really didn't feel appreciated by that, that Oscar that she had won. But in 1984, she won a second Oscar, and it was for a movie that was titled Places in the Heart. And she gave a memorable speech as a result of this Oscar, I want to share with you, I want to quote her uh, this morning as it talks about uh, her career and her need for approval. Let me share with you. It says, I haven't had an orthodox career. I haven't, let me, let me start over. I haven't not had an orthodox career. I've wanted more than anything to have your respect. The first time I didn't feel it. But this time, I feel it. And I can't deny the fact that you like me. Right now, you like me. Many of us, I think, like Sally Field, need that sense of approval. I think many of us like to hear in our own lives, that a boy, you've done a great job. Doug, and I want to tell you, you did do a great job, brother, and I appreciate that. But I know you didn't do it because you wanted the, that a boy. And then some of us want to hear, that a girl, you did a, a great job. We, we're, it's just inbred in us. We need someone to applaud what we do in life. We need someone to help us feel better. And we hate rejection. It turns us off. It's something that breaks our heart. We are addicts to people pleasing, I think. Let me ask you a question. I need you to be honest with, with me, but I also need you to be honest with yourself. I want to ask this question, and I want to see your hands. How many of you really do want to make everyone else happy. Let's see your hands. We want to make everyone else happy. I'm the same way. We desire to make other people happy. And so this morning as we look at the Scripture, I, I pray that, that God would convict us where conviction is needing. But the goal of the message this morning is that we can begin to understand that the purpose for our lives is to please God and not to please man. And there are a couple of things that I want to share with you this morning concerning that. So I want to ask that you would honor God by standing at the reading of His Word, Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I would not be a slave of Christ. Verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. We pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, today, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace and we begin to praise you even now, Father, as you have allowed us an opportunity to worship you through song, you've allowed us an opportunity to worship you through prayer, Lord, now you allow us an opportunity to worship you through the teaching and preaching of your word. Father, as we gather today, I pray that you would convict us where conviction is needed, that you would show us through your word the importance of seeking to please you above all else. And Father, we ask these things today in the matchless and most holy name of Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen. I was 
searching, and I want to tell you, if you don't know this by now, let me share with you. You can get on Google, and you can type a question in, and the answer will pop up. And so this week, I was curious. I typed up symptoms of people pleasing, and I want to tell you, there was a list of things that popped up. There were several different websites. One website said there are seven symptoms to people pleasing. Another one said eight symptoms to people pleasing. Another one said that there were ten symptoms to people pleasing. What I did is I, I looked at those lists, those three different lists that I saw there, um, and I, I looked at the variances. I tried to see how different they were. There were a lot of things that, that were relevant across the board. A lot of things were the same from, from one list to the other list. If you go home, you Google that, and you'll see these lists because those are the, the main three that popped up when I, I researched it. But there were three that were on the list that were common across the board. Those are the three that I want to share with you this morning very, very quickly. Symptoms of people pleasing. We need to know these. And I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. Do I, I have a habit of, of being a people pleaser? Because there's some danger in that. And I want you to, to, to get that through the scripture this morning. But the first thing that I want to do, I want to share these three symptoms very, very quickly. These three most prominent scripture that dealt with people pleasing and, and the number one reason that y you ask yourself am I a people pleaser one of the number one things that, that you'll know is this that that you take criticism personally let me ask you a question. Do you take criticism personally? When someone objects to you, when someone has maybe they differ, have a different opinion than you do just a little bit, do you take that personally? Some of us do. Some of the time we take these, these um, criticisms personally. It breaks our heart when someone is against us, doesn't it? It really does. I, I know that I want to be liked by you. Most of you, I know that you want me to like you. Some of you, I know you don't care and that's okay. But here's the thing that some of us really, really take criticism personally. I think for those who take criticism personally, there's no such thing there is as constructive criticism. For, for those who take criticism personally, that's an oxymoronic statement. It doesn't make sense in our mind. And we really, really take it hard. I'll tell you a story. If you read our scroll article this week, you, you got this story. But I want to kind of do a cut down version of that story this morning that really goes along with this, this criticism. There is this fable of this old man and his grandson. They were going to town. They had a donkey. And as they were traveling towards the city to the marketplace alongside the road, they uh, come along and they passed several different groups of people along the way. As they were passing the first group they came upon, there was this group and someone spoke up and said, I can't believe that you're allowing this little bitty boy to walk. You're making him walk all the way to town. You've got a perfectly good donkey there. Why don't you set your, this grandson on the donkey and allow him to ride all the way in? They continued on. The, the, the grandfather took the, the son, grandson, and he put him up on the donkey because he thought, wow, Okay, I, I, let's make these people happy. And so they do that, and, and they go along. Grandson's riding on the donkey. The, the grandfather is pulling the donkey along. He's leading, and then they come up on another group. And as they come up on this other group, all of a sudden, they look at the child up there, and they, they say, I can't believe, son, that you would ride the donkey and make your poor grandfather walk and lead the donkey to town. Grandson looked at the grandfather. Grandfather looked at the grandson. They thought for a minute and the grandfather said, son, why don't you get on down? And then the grandfather got on the donkey. They continued to walk and as they were walking, they came upon another group and they came upon this group and they said, why in the world would both of you not ride on that donkey? Isn't that what donkeys are for? They're to carry your burdens and you're having to walk into town. So why don't both of you ride the donkey? And so the old man looked at the grandson and he said, come on up here with me, son. And he picked him up and he placed him in front of him on the donkey. By this time, this donkey is getting wore out. It's coming on into the market and it's carrying the load of both of them. They pass one more group and this other group, they come along and they say, I can't believe that you two are burdening that donkey with your weight. 
Why don't you both get off of that donkey and walk him into the marketplace so that he won't wear, wear, it, wear it out? And so they did. They both got down. They thought to themselves, well, how can we keep from burning the donkey? So they got a pole. They tied the pole around the donkey's legs. They, they picked the donkey up. They carried it on the shoulders. But the weight was too much for the little boy. And as they began to carry this donkey, the little boy, they were on a bridge at this point. The little boy dropped his end. When he dropped his end of the pole, the donkey's leg come out. And then it began to kick. And as it began to kick, it began to sway a little bit and ended up into the river. And the donkey drowned. And sometimes that's the dangers that we face with trying to please everybody. I'm going to tell you it's a proven fact. By the time you please this person, somebody else is going to be upset because you didn't do it the way they wanted you to do it. And you can never be satisfied internally. You can never be self-satisfied because you're always taking that personal criticism the wrong way. And you can never get anything done. And so well, that's the first thing. You take personal criticism personally. You take criticism personally. Number two is this. You have a fear of rejection. I don't know about you, but I really do have a, a fear of rejection. Every week when I get up here to preach, I'm telling you, I pray a, a, a specific prayer, Lord, remove the spirit of fear and timidity. That's the first thing, because when I get up here to preach a word, I want you to enjoy what I'm preaching. I want you to feel like you're hearing a message and, and that God is speaking to your hearts. And, and I feel like there's a certain way that I have to preach in order for you to enjoy the word as it's preached. I'm just confessing that this morning. I... Do not like it when you do not enjoy the message that's preached. I don't. I feel rejected. I feel like you have something against me for whatever reason. And, and it's not a, a good place to be. We, it's like standing in, in front of the American Idol judges. And I'm going to tell you, I can't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid on it. Some of you know that. Others don't want to know that. But I feel like I'm standing up there and... The old dog man himself is just going to look at me and he's going to say, The hog, why are you even up here? And, and I feel like I'm always being judged. You ever felt like that, that you're always being judged by someone else? You, you ever felt like there's someone always looking at you and they're, they're scrutinizing every single thing that you do? Have you ever felt like that as an individual? It's, it's not an enjoyable place to be. And there's that, that fear of rejection. We, we do not enjoy being rejected. In the, the book titled The Search for Significance, Robert McGee wrote this. Listen, he said, Living according to the false belief that I must be approved by certain others to feel good about myself causes us to fear rejection confirming virtually all of our attitudes and actions to the exception or to the expectation of others. It, are you guilty of that? Is there there's some part in your life where you just absolutely you you can't stand the thought of someone else rejecting you. And so in our lives we we want to please everyone and there's some dangers to that. And then the third thing quickly this morning as we continue on talking about these symptoms for people pleasing. And, and the third thing is this, that you have a hard time saying no. I want to see a show of hands this morning. Be honest with yourself and, and with me. How many of you, when someone comes up to you and asks you to do something, how many of you have a hard time saying no? Yeah. Why? Why? Sometimes we don't feel like it, do we? Sometimes we, we don't want to say yes, but we do because we don't want to feel rejected. Because we don't want someone to be mad at us. That personal criticism, we feel like in our hearts, well, they're going to criticize me now because I said no. And so we say yes, and then we kind of limp through whatever it is they've asked us to do instead of really taking a hold of it with a passion and with a heart of service and do it the way God wishes that we would do it. And so we, we say no. Let me give you an example of this. I think this is such a great example. How many of you have dogs? Yeah. Do you know your dog is a people pleaser? 
When you go in the room and you call for your dog, what does that dog do? It runs right to you, most of them, right? Most of those animals, they run right to you and, and they're sitting there at your feet and, and they're, you're petting their head and they're just really, really enjoying that you're uh, showing them attention. They're licking and slobbering all over you. They're trying to show you affection because their greatest desire is to please you, their master. Matter of fact, when you whistle, it's kind of like being a dog at a, at a whistling convention. <laughs> Then, then that dog is, is going to go right over there to that person that's whistling. And then if somebody else whistles over here, that dog's going to leave over here and it's going to go over here to this person that's whistling. And then that dog, somebody else is going to whistle over here and then that dog's going to run over there because that dog is responding to the, to, the, to the whistle. And that dog's greatest desire is that it please everyone. And that can be a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Sometimes, listen, sometimes we have to learn to say, no, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says this, the fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare. Listen to that. It's talk, talking about a trap, a stumbling block. That's what a snare is. S some form or fashion, this snare is a stumbling block. The fear of man brings a stumbling block. Does that make sense? Because we want to please everyone. We want people to say, they're doing a great job. Or, or, or we want people to say, wow, I'm, I'm so thankful for them. We, we need that encouragement, but we need it even at the expense of wearing our own selves out. Trying to please everyone. And so Proverbs 29 verse 25, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. I love that. The focus here is this, that our greatest desire shouldn't be to, to please every single person that has a request of us, but our greatest desire is to make sure that we're honoring God and His Word and His commands for us to live by. That's what our heart's desires should be, is to honor God and God first. That's exactly what Paul said. If you know the background of Galatians, you know that from the Jewish standpoint, they believed in the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and they, they believed that you had to be obedient to all of those laws. There were over 600 laws, some positive, some negative. There were over 600 laws in, in, in the Torah, though, to, to be obedient to. And if you understand one thing, you understand this, that it's impossible to be obedient to every one of those laws, isn't it? How many of you come up to a stop sign? Just give you this. You know it says stop, right? It doesn't say slow down, make sure no one else is coming. It says stop. And I have some police officers here this morning, so I need you to answer this. How many of you, you roll through that? Raise your hand this morning. Now, come on, raise your hand. All right. You, you see those hands that are raised up. Y'all write, write their names down real quick. You can get them. <laughs> But it says stop. Listen, I make the same. That's my reaction as well. I come up and if there's no one there, I'm just going to right on through. I, I'm thinking, well, there's nobody here. Why should I stop? But listen to this. I've even seen cops do the same thing. It's impossible to, to be obedient, completely obedient. But the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And then... Any of you, you remember this story about Jesus being crucified and he's there before Pilate and, and the crowd and Mark 15 verse 15 says this, so Pilate wanting to gratify the crowd released Barabbas to them and he delivered Jesus after he'd scourged him to be crucified. The people were there in the crowd and, and they were jeering. They were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Release Barabbas, release him. We want Bar Barabbas to be released. Crucify Jesus. They were yelling it, they were shouting it, and Pilate wanted to please the people instead of please God. And what did he do? He released a murderer and a thief. And he crucified the King of kings and Lord of lords. I just wonder how many times we've been guilty of doing that very same thing in our lives. And so there's one thing that I want to share with you this morning. This is point two, and it's seek God's approval instead of people's applause. We've got to learn how to do that. 
You've got to learn how to seek God's approval instead of the applause of man. And quickly, there are two things that I want to share with you because I, I feel like we, we need to get this. We need to understand this. We, we need to be able to apply this to our hearts this morning. And, and so this is what Paul said in verse 10. He says, do I now persuade men? Rhetorical question. Or God? Do I now persuade men or God? There was a time in Paul's life when his greatest desire was to please the people. And the people wanted to see the church of Jesus Christ destroyed. The people, the, the, the Pharisees, they wanted to see the church destroyed. And so Paul went around from church to church. He came, he knocked on the doors and... As he knocked on the doors, the people would open the doors as they worshiped Jesus. He would come in and he would ask them, are you worshiping Jesus Christ? And if they said yes, they put them in handcuffs, they took them out, they stoned them, they, they crucified them. They did all of those things. And Paul was the greatest offender of the gospel of Jesus Christ at that point. But something changed in his heart, something changed in his life, because one day, literally while he was in the process of trying to destroy the church, that he met King Jesus face to face. And he's walking on the road to Damascus, and he's walking on the road to Damascus, Jesus himself appears to him, and he sees him. And it's a, a testimony that Paul, at that point, from that point on, he was willing to die for Jesus. Because the question was asked, why do you kick against the goad? Why do you kick against something? Why do you fight against something that you know you cannot defeat? Why are you fighting and fussing about something that you know you have no control over? That's what Jesus asked God. Jesus asked Paul. He was blinded from the glory of Lord Jesus. He was blinded by that, that experience, that encounter, and it changed his life forever. And from that point on, and if you know anything, you know that this was the first letter that, that Paul had written, and, and he's, he really, at this point, he doesn't exactly know how to talk to people. He doesn't exactly know how he's supposed to respond to things. And, and so, as we talked about this last week, he said this. He said, I marvel, I'm amazed that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel. They wanted to distort, they wanted to change the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we learned last week that Paul said, And if we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel of which there is no other, let him be accursed. Anathema was that word and it literally meant cursed to hell. He said if we're doing it or if an angel from heaven, a messenger of God is preaching anything other than Christ and Him crucified, then let Him be accursed to hell. That's a strong statement. And then He repeated it because He needed it to be emphasized. And as He did that, then He goes on and He starts this, and then He says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. At this point, because he saw Jesus on that road to Damascus, he now is a slave of Jesus Christ. And as a bondservant, his greatest desire was to honor Jesus with every step that he made. He wanted to please God. No longer did he want to please the masses. He had one focus, one ministry in mind, and that was to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if it cost him his life, Life, he was going to be obedient to preach and proclaim the good news. And he did that. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until it was time for Paul to go finally meet Jesus face to face in heaven. And so, two things quickly I want to share with you. Seek God's approval instead of people's applause. Two things quickly. Number one is this. Serve God without any desire for recognition. Serve God without any desire for recognition. 
in Sunday school, we talked about this just a little bit. But our greatest desire as men and women is to glorify God in our walk. Listen to me. In your walk as a child of God, your greatest desire to, should be to please God above all. Your greatest desire. You should desire to please Jesus. Not be a people pleaser, but to be a, a God pleaser because God has a purpose for you. And the question is, what is God's purpose for you? It has to be about you. Why Oh, you. As an individual, has God called you to glorify King Jesus in your life? You can answer that. Yes. What has God called you to do? Glorify, God. glorify Himself. What has God called you to do, church? I, you're, you're not getting it, and, and I'm going to stay here until you get this. Listen, what is God called the church to do? That's not it. I'm, I'm going to tell you. If he were here with us this morning, I really don't think he would be satisfied with that. And if he's not going to be satisfied, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to be satisfied because I'm not here to please you this morning. I'm here to preach the gospel. And God's desire for you is to do what? Glorify him. Your greatest desire as a man, woman, or child should be to glorify Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords in your life. That means sometimes you have to say no to the crowd. That means sometimes you have to stand up and say, I'm not into that. That means sometimes you have to put a, a breastplate on so that you can protect yourself from, from the fiery darts of the wicked one. Because I can tell you, as a Christian, as a man or woman or child that loves Jesus, you are under attack. And you've got to learn that you are under attack and that you've got to learn that it's okay for you to say no because you don't need to be a people pleaser with every single thing that you do. You need to have a desire to serve God without any des desire of recognition. And, and so I ask that. Listen to what, what God's Word says uh, here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. You definitely will recognize it when I begin to read it. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore... When you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that you may have glory from men. We're guilty of that. And this is what Matthew said. Don't put on a face for every person you see. This, so many times we just wear masks. For this group, we have this mask on, and so we have to take one off and we have to put another one on. For this group over here, we have to take this mask off, and there's another one over here that's sitting, and we have to put this mask on. And then for this group right here, we have to take this mask on, off, and we have to put this one on. We... We change our minds so many different times because our desire isn't to please God. Our desire is to please everybody else. And he said, Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that you may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. I love that. Because God sees your heart. God sees your heart. Do you get that? God sees your heart. Before you entered into the sanctuary this morning, you need to know that God looked at your heart. God wanted to know if you were coming in here to worship Him or if you were coming in here to please people or if you... He, he, he knows exactly why you're here this morning. And so the question is this. Why are you here? In spirit and in truth. Thank you. To glorify God in spirit and in truth. When we get that, it is not about us. God can radically change our world. 
when we begin to ha have an epiphany, when we see the light go off, when, when we experience God in a, in a brand new way, there, there's a, a moment in our life where we transition from being this person to being a man or a woman who seeks to bring honor to Jesus Christ in every decision, every step that we make. And that has to be you. That has to be your outlook look in life. You. And then when it's you individually, then it will become us collectively. And then when it becomes us collectively, can I tell you, at that point, we will be able to charge hell with a water pistol because the victory has already been won when we as a church make our mind up that we want to glorify King Jesus. And so we've got to get that. You don't deserve the accolades. You don't deserve the praise. I don't deserve the accolades. I don't deserve the praise. But my King Jesus does. There's a poem I want to read. Powerful. Written by Ruth Harms Calkin. It's entitled, I Wonder. This is what she writes. Listen to this. You know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor in the limelight. You know how eagerly I speak for you at the women's club. You know how I effervesce when I promote a fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react? I wonder if you pointed me to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month in a room where nobody else saw me. That's powerful. How would you respond? Because some are never getting the applause of men, but they serve their Jesus faithfully day after day. Some are getting the applause of men, and the only time they serve Him is in the, the view of spectators. But the question is, do you deserve the accolade? Or when somebody is praising you, do you just say, okay, Lord, here it is. You receive that. If somebody says, good job, I, I try, I try. I'm, sometimes I'm sure I'm guilty of, of just receiving it myself, but when somebody says, good job, preacher, I'm telling you, I try and just say, Lord, glory to you. If you've asked me, you know you've heard me say that. Praise God. Or thank you. But it's really, for me, it's, I'm telling you, it's about my Jesus. And I hope you know that that's my heart, and my heart's genuine to... To bring glory to my Jesus. And then number two, the last thing this morning that I submit to you is you've got to live if the only opinion that matters is God's. Yeah. You've got to live as though the only opinion that matters is God's. How many of you do that? Do you live as though the only opinion that matters is God's? I don't mean being sarcastic. I don't mean being pompous. I don't mean being up front in somebody's face. No. But I do mean, do you live your life? Do you make your decisions based on glorifying King Jesus? Do you make your decisions in life as though God were the only one that mattered? Is that a valid question or what? It is, isn't it? And so you have to answer that for yourself. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 and 4 says this, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Whew. Judge not, lest you be judged. He who judges me is the Lord. You can talk about me. You can speak.
spit at me, you can jeer at me, you can be sarcastic and cynical, and I'm telling you, I can do those things just as well as anybody can. But I have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. And I have to give an account for my actions. And you, you have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. And you, you have to give an account for your actions. What will that day be like for you? What will that day be like? Here's a, a good verse. Write this down. Isaiah 49 verse 16. I want you to know how much God cares about you. And it says that He has engraved you on the palms of His hands. You. God has engraved you on the palms of His hands. God wants to know you. God cares about you. God's desire is to work through you. And He has you engraved on the palms of His hands. And that means that it's about a relationship with Him. To please Him. And then, one more verse. Well, I didn't write, it, I didn't write the, the Scripture verse down, but it, it's this. He, he has even numbered the hairs on your heads. You know, God knows that, right? Doesn't He? God knows you so intimately, and God desires that you know Him so intimately. And, and God's desire for you is, is that you would stop trying to please everyone else because when we begin to do that, we stretch ourselves so thin, don't we? And then we feel like there's that tug of war. You remember a few weeks ago, I talked about that just a little bit, that spiritual battle. There's, there's this over here and then there's this over here and we feel like there's this battle and, and we're just being stretched so thin and there's this group over here and we desire to please them and so we say yes. And there's this group over here and, and we're pulled and stretched over to this direction and, and we say yes. And then there's this group right here and we're, we're stretched right here in the middle and, and we say yes. And reality is that we cannot say yes to them, them, and them because at that point there becomes no work. You're too weak to do the work that you vested in. And so what is it that God is calling you to? What, what specifically is it that God desires of you? Understand the pitfalls of, of people pleasing. Understand that you have to learn to say no. Understand that, that it's okay for you to be re rejected by someone because your greatest desire should be to please God and not man. And so I want to ask you this morning. Are you like the old man who's taking his donkey into the market? He takes this donkey and every group that he and his grandson pass, he feels like he's supposed to please them. And then in the very end, what happens is they get on the bridge of the market and they're carrying the donkey themselves. And the workhorse loses its footing as it's being carried on this pole and it falls into the river and drowns. Is that you? Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to please everyone and stretching yourself so thin? Let me tell you something today. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. But Paul said this, Am I here to please men or am I here to please God? Now sometimes understand this. Sometimes pleasing men is pleasing God. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But when you find yourself in the middle being pulled in all different directions, you have got to ask God the direction He wants you to be pulled. I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, today in the mighty name of Jesus, we just want to come and we just want to thank you for being Lord in our lives. And Paul said to the Galatians, he said it didn't matter what the world says. That he was going to please you. And in order for him to please you, that meant that he had to go against the flow of things. And that meant that he had to take a stand. 
And that meant that he had to say that I'm not here to please men, but I'm here to please God. And Father, I pray today as your word goes forth that it will not return void. I pray that our greatest desire is, is about your kingdom and furthering your kingdom. And Lord, that might look a little bit different in all of our lives. But Father, I pray that as the world takes hold of our arms and it begins to pull us in so many different directions, that you would allow us to experience your peace, that you would allow us to experience your grace, and that you would allow us the wisdom to come to you and say, okay, Lord, I'm being pulled in all of these different directions, but today I want to know the direction you want me to go. And Father, I pray that you would burden our hearts today, that we would truly begin to seek you. Father, I, I don't know this morning if there's even one person here who, who hasn't trusted King Jesus as Lord and Savior. So Father, I ask that today, as you've spoken to our hearts about the pitfalls of people pleasing, Lord, I, I pray that, that the one thing that we would begin to do is seek to please you. And if there's even one person here who is lost, who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is one of those moments where it will please the congregation. But Father, even most importantly, it pleases you. When someone who does not know you confesses their sin to an almighty God and asks Jesus to be Lord of their lives. And so, Father, I pray today if there's even one lost soul here, if there's even one person who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. And Father, we just want to thank you for your word and its power. And we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to stand this morning as we have an invitation. You stand. What is it that God has laid on your heart today? You come. What do you need to, to leave at the foot of the cross? You come today. You come.